some way calling back to the films that meant a lot to me, but I want to revise them. I'm really not into the nostalgia of it. I'm into the veracity of those stories. You know, I think the werewolf is an amazing uh, way to explore certain ideas about existentialism, suicide, <laughs> what is the meaning of life? If you only had a few more hours, what would you do with them? You know, those are sort of the themes in this film. And then Frankenstein is, there are other themes like, who am I? I wake up and I'm in this body and I don't know, I'm haunted by old memories. And so those are my ways into these stories that I loved as a kid. Hello, and thank you for joining us for the Woodstock Film Festival Let's Talk Film podcast. I'm your host, Adam Chartoff. The Woodstock Film Festival is a haven for networking with high caliber industry members, voting members of the Academy, filmmakers, musicians, and fiercely independent artists. Keep an eye on our social media and other forms of communication as lots of announcements will probably be coming over the next days and weeks. This is Larry Fezenden here, a longtime friend of the Woodstock Film Festival, longtime friend of mine. But thank you, Larry, for coming on. You um, founded Glass Eye Picks, also shares the adjective fierce in the description, by the way. Did you know that? You, you share that in common with the Woodstock Film Festival? Yes, although I, I just say fierce independent media. Fiercely. fiercely. I don't use the adverb. adverb. I avoided the adverb. Stephen King was opposed to adverbs. Uh, adverbs. It's very interesting to read his book on Ooh. writing. I recommend it to anyone interested. It's a great book about writing, and he rails against adverbs. But never mind that. Uh, King? <laughs> Stephen King, yeah. Stephen King, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, I think I vaguely remember that. Um, I think that's we have that upstairs, in fact. You, you're a producer, a director, writer, actor, multi-hyphenate. And we'll get to your new film. I, of course, saw it, so I can speak on the film. But we'll get to that in a little bit. I'm curious because I think by the time I met you in the last, I don't know, eight and ten to ten years, you were already involved with films at the Woodstock Film Festival. So can you talk about how that came about and your relationship with the Woodstock Film Festival? Uh, well, I've been coming upstate since uh, 1998. Uh, I don't really know, Mayra will have a much clearer memory of how we got to know each other. She insists it was years before, and so it may have been because of course I'm a New York independent filmmaker, meaning downstate, down in the city, and uh, we had uh, various associates in common. But in any case, I applied to the Woodstock Film Festival in 2001, and, uh, and I, my film Wendigo was accepted and then we carried the day and won the best feature award though we shared it uh with another film and forgive me i can't remember the other film's name which is the nature of the narcissist uh filmmaker uh but what i thought was interesting is that the reason is that the jury liked my film but they couldn't bear to give the award to a horror movie because horror movies aren't serious uh, was the premise and of course i object to this uh, idea because i make horror films that are trying to be relevant to our social issues of the day anyway i did enjoy by the way I, I i don't mean to interrupt you but that is the case with your new film yeah well that's kind of my uh i made a film called the last winter which is about climate change and it's not like it made a difference in the world but at least i made my statement about um so i'm just saying that the whole point of horror is to put a uh, expose some of the dark elements that are in play in society so i actually consider it a fairly serious genre of course there's a mi million ex exceptions but so it is with all types of films that's all that was my plug for uh the genre of horror yeah and uh, I think uh, I think that also other genres have also felt marginalized in that re same way. Well, like slapstick comedy. I mean, these are serious issues. 
Falling on a banana peel is not to be taken lightly. No. Uh, anyway, There's a lot of food insecurity in the world. <laughs> yes. You know. um, but listen, yes, to be clear. So Woodstock was very good to me uh, right at the outset. But more importantly, uh, it's a wonderful community. And it feels like a vital festival because it is adjacent to New York, but independent. It obviously has the, the legacy of the town and the name. And uh, I've seen it grow in size and purpose, but also retain its independent vibe. So yes, it is fiercely independent. And I've had many films play here over the years, which has been a great pleasure. My favorite part being their support of my son's films. Jack Fessenden uh, has played a lot of shorts here and then went on to play two of his feature films. Uh, they're also local movies, and I think it is cool for a festival to celebrate uh, local work. Um, right. You live. Uh, you have a, a home, which you're in right yeah, now. Yeah, near Woodstock. So yeah, and you shoot most of the, a number of the films around the area. So you're right. Yeah, I was going to bring that up. Yeah, I love shooting locally. I mean, I just like the environment, which is why we found a spot here to plant our flag. And uh, I've had many, many filmmakers come up here and shoot on the property and in the general area, some of whom have gone on to far more fame and fortune than myself. Jim Mickle, for example, we made a great film called Stakeland in the area. We shot in Pine Hill and, uh, and all over Margaretville and so on. And my own, yeah, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. No, no, no. Actually, this lends itself to what I, I it actually made me think about this next question, which is your penchant, for lack of another word, of, of, of fostering and encouraging, uh, supporting other filmmakers, whether younger or whomever. And uh, like you say, uh, offering up your, the property to for other people to film on. How did this come about? How did you develop that? that sensibility it's just my nature uh on the one hand i'm a shy person and i really dislike other people but at the same time i believe in the notion of community and how important that is to furthering uh any hope for happiness and camaraderie and so i really like to inspire other artists you know i always say i can't make every movie that interests me but i can be part of someone else finding inspiration and that's that's really my agenda is to help people realize their vision and realize it isn't all about uh money because money is just a horrible drag to find and chase down and so what are other ways we can express ourselves and that's why i've offered uh whatever i've been able to offer offer over the years. I mean, this is an ongoing project for decades, really. Uh, editing equipment and then whatever I have and then and then advice. And, you know, I've had a company, Glass Eye Picks, and that has been the agenda. And we've launched many careers. Uh, Ty West, Kelly Reichert, Jim Mickle, uh, Joe Maggio, and, and then several who are maybe less known, but uh, also wonderful artists. So it's just Ilya Chaikin. I just like to see people uh, find themselves and express themselves. Like any true misanthrope. I am a misanthrope in the end, though. But Arguable. I do believe in creating a tiny pocket of uh, resistance to my own misanthropy. Is that a word? Misanthropy? misanthropy. Yes. yes, I believe it is. So. Yeah. Hey, so when you were, you know, starting off, uh, you were making films like, oh, you mentioned Wendigo, Habit was another early feature you made. Yep. Did you have some sort of mentor yourself? Because that would also explain maybe why you like to do the same type of thing. But uh, I'm just wondering if that, if you had experienced that yourself. No. In fact, I say the opposite. I say that I tried really? to create an atmosphere that I wish I had had. I oh. think. I had a certain amount of talent, but I couldn't quite figure out how to negotiate showbiz. And so while I treaded water and sputtered in confusion, uh, 
I, I did know that other people who were sputtering and treading needed support. And so I would sort of encourage them. So, you know, I, I actually always say that, that uh, I just wanted to provide the kind of uh, infrastructure that I wish I'd been provided. It doesn't mean I didn't have wonderful people influencing me over the years, but um, no, I can't point to a mentor. I mean, years later, Guillermo del Toro has been very kind to me. He's tried to get me to work on a Hollywood movie. We had a very good collaboration for a brief period to remake uh, a, a Spanish film called The Orphanage. So Guillermo has been supportive and many actors have and come to my aid and generally been, you know, lent their talents. But uh, no, I never had, well, I had a great producer, Jeff Levy Hinty. He made Wendigo and he made uh, The Last Winter. And I had many comrades along the way, but we were in the trenches together. I can't say it was somebody reaching down and, um, offering me a Lego, but that's, I, I'm, that's not, I know you're not complaining. That is I'm not complaining. Yeah. I'm just, these are the situations, but it, it's the very lack of that, that almost drives me further to see if I can provide some version of that to, to others. Cause I just, I know how important it is. You need somebody. I mean, I love Ty West. He makes the comment that uh, Larry just made him feel like he could make movies. You know, it's just literally that subtle thing. It's a very subtle uh, thing, mentorship. Yeah. Does it does it uh, also require an instinct or include an instinct for it? Because like Ty West turns out, yeah, pretty good storyteller. It's a filmmaker. Well, absolutely. And let's be clear. I mean, these guys aren't all guys and gals. They're actually, we all fear the sensibility. And the, I always like to point out that, you know, Kelly Reichert, um, and Ty West are similar filmmakers. They're interested in the details and the rhythms of life. They they work in different genres. Their maybe their agenda is different. Uh, but you know, Ty was known as the slow burn filmmaker. Hmm. Uh, that's not a high compliment uh, for the horror crowd. They technically want thrills and chills. Right. So Ty carved a very specific part of the the horror genre and then kelly of course is an art filmmaker really preeminent at this point very respected but her movies are slow observational and i would say there's a similarity and then my own films are not always a slam dunk for the horror crowd they're really preoccupied with other things the rhythms of life and then of course i like to bring in a little a little fun like a little werewolf story for example <laughs> General, maybe if you could uh, speak on the festival uh, component to getting one's film out into the world, you know, and how crucial that has been for you, if it has, uh, and how it's kind of evolved in over time a little bit. Well, I, I haven't evolved at all. I still... Or have, festivals have evolved, is my point. Oh, festivals have. Or have not, maybe. Well, look, I was old enough to remember when the USA Festival, I think it was called, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. started, and that turned into Sundance. Uh, I'm also old enough to have never gotten into Sundance and resented it bitterly. Uh, I'm old enough to never have gotten into South By or Tribeca with my own films. And so that leads to maybe the topic here, which is that these more regional festivals would accept my films. And um, that was incredibly important because it gave you a sense of, uh, well, just identity. You know, you felt like you were part of something. And your real agenda as a filmmaker, unless I'm mistaken, is to get to the audience. And so these smaller festivals are really essential. And obviously we've seen Woodstock grow and now I guess it's uh, Academy uh, uh, eligible and that's fantastic. Uh, that shows tenacity and stick to and whatever it indicates about the people who are running the festival, sticking to it and, and, and growing their brand, so to speak. But uh, for the rest of us- Well, and survival too. Well, exactly, uh, survival. And that's something I'm a little bit uh, part of, 
the idea of surviving because I, I have not punched up. I'm not new line now. <laughs> I'm still glass I pick. Some people have heard of the company. Uh, I think we have a brand. That's about the most I can say about what we are, but nobody knows about it or cares. It's just that if you were to look into it, you go, oh, well, that's cool. They, they did that or they're, these people were connected. Anyway, um, I, I really believe, you know, in the entire scope of things. Uh, remember, we're also Americans and humans and part of the earth. And uh, you have to sort of resist the corporatization of everything. So these smaller uh, entities that are doing good work and trying to have a force uh, participate in the world are, are essential. And I believe in regional and small voices. That's sort of what my company would stand for. Now, if we were suddenly able to sell out, well, we'd see how we did. We'd see where our moral fiber actually landed. But uh, meanwhile, it's very easy for us to take a stand <laughs> against uh, <laughs> corporatization because we've never been invited to the party. <laughs> <laughs> well, the party you're referring again to Sundance and South by and Tri-Tech. Yeah, as soon as they ask, I'll be there. Oh, I'll be there. <laughs> yeah. Bob Redford, and please pay no attention to this interview. <laughs> Because we all know Bob Redford is choosing the movies. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. You made, uh, back in 1995, a uh, horror film called Habit, which was, I'd say, a vampire movie. Yes, although I kept it a secret. That was part of my concept. It's a great movie if you don't know it's a vampire movie. But yeah. I, I know what you mean. I think that's that was smart. In uh, 2019, you waited a couple of years. You made your Frankenstein film. Yeah. You you give the story credit co credit to Mary Shelley. In fact, say I don't. And one re one interviewer like called me out on it, and I was like, dude, I'm I'm really not sure that's too. I don't think I'm trying to get away with something. This is a beloved tribute to Mary Shelley, Frankenstein, her story. All right, so 2019, Depraved, and then only four years later, you have now a new film called Blackout, and it is your werewolf film, as you already alluded to. So you've made, now you've completed this trilogy, this cycle of uh, films. You know, it seems like it's, it is your nod to Universal Pictures, uh, which I know you you were uh, they were before your time in terms of when they were made, but obviously they had an enormous influence on you as a young person. And uh, I also understand maybe that there may not be a creature of the Black Lagoon in the future. Although I don't even re really require very much makeup if you're if you're looking to cast such a project. But can you, know. you swim? <laughs> <laughs> I can tread like a mother. And do you have abs? Because all my monsters have abs. They do. I noticed that. Yeah. Yeah, this this werewolf is very sexy. I agree. Yeah, uh, I felt very middle aged watching that film. Yes, well, I made him lose the weight because I these are my <laughs> avatars now, these creatures. So I tell them to take their clothes off and look good naked, as Tom Waits would say. <laughs> <laughs> uh, blackout. What? What uh, was this? Very. I, I assume this was an intentional decision. To, well, all decisions are fairly intentional, but this was a, an active decision to make these three films in particular as a cycle? Uh, well, you know, like, I'm an old carny, like, like Barnum and Bailey Circus, you know, so I actually just make connections between my movies and then present them that way. On the one hand, yes, absolutely. I, I am deeply inspired by the Universal Pictures, but I made several movies after Habit. In fact- Well, you didn't make them in a row. I wasn't suggesting that- Yeah, but I also have a- you know, I, this done. I have a cycle of Wendigo movies. <laughs> uh, well, there's a new one. Were you involved in that at all? What? There's a new Wendigo, isn't there? I thought there was a new Wendigo. It's funny you say that. I saw something about that. but. Uh, yeah, I mean, Wendigo has been done, and Guillermo del Toro made a Wendigo movie called Antlers, and uh, right, it's now a, it's it's a subgenre. It's sort of like making movies about the abominable snowman, although 
I deeply revere the Wendigo mythology and uh, I'm always intrigued how it is uh, treated. It is one a, a much more slippery mythology than, you know, werewolves. Werewolves, especially mine, you know, they're derived from The Wolfman by Lon Chaney. That was a universal picture uh, from 1941. And then obviously subsequent all the way up to uh, American Werewolf in London. And a lot of people are always obsessed with what type of creature my guy has, whether he has a snout or if he's flat faced. There's all these conversations in the, the horror world. Anyway, yes, it's deliberate on the one hand, but it just came about. I always wanted to make a Frankenstein movie and I always loved werewolves. I tried to make this in 1990. I went to Miramax. Um, before it was <laughs> scandalized. Um, <laughs> and heard. In the 90s, that was an indie film studio to go to, and I pitched them um, sure was. Uh, a movie called Werewolf by Night, which was uh, the idea of adapting a, a Marvel comic, believe it or not. Marvel did make horror stories. Frankenstein, Wolfman, and Dracula. And so I wanted to do that. Well, they said, we thought you were an outsider filmmaker. And I was like, oh my God, it's only 1995 and I've already been pigeonholed. <laughs> so be it. So years later, I have made uh, some version of an indie werewolf movie. And I'm, I'm very happy with the story that I ended up telling. And yeah, I, I, I am in some way calling back to the films that meant a lot to me but I want to revise them. I'm really not into the nostalgia of it. I'm into the veracity of those stories. You know, I think the werewolf is an amazing uh, way to explore certain ideas about existentialism, suicide. <laughs> what is the meaning of life? If you only had a few more hours, what would you do with them? You know, those are sort of the themes in this film. And then Frankenstein is, there are other themes like, who am I? I wake up. And I'm in this body and I don't know, I'm haunted by old memories. And so those are my ways into these stories that I loved as a kid. Uh, and yes, I, if I can get the budget for a uh, creature from the Black, Black Lagoon, I'm sure it'll be probably about environmental, you know, because if you're gonna talk about creatures swimming around in the water you gotta realize that we've fucked that up done terrible things to our planet so some stories suggest an environmental theme and some suggest yeah like your, your creature. drama theme you know these monsters are so cool they're just maybe, interesting yeah so maybe in this this version it's the water's too hot for the creature so he comes out you know because he can't stand how hot it is anymore okay let's do a writing session as soon as we finish with this interview Okay. <laughs> so, we're something uh, it is to punish people who go to horror movies and make them think about how terrible they've been <laughs> right there it could be like the true horror is or life is much more scary than now the films that we're watching well that is my point in fact wendigo sort of speaks about that it's um our need for mythologies and stories to kind of make up for the random uh, violence of life. So in a weird way, my movies are extremely um, serious and, but, you know, I would argue that they're also fun because you have these wonderful, the aesthetic of the full moon and the creaking woods and the snowy hoof monster and all those fun things. But ultimately I'm, very preoccupied with the real horrors that we're dealing with, and they don't get better, unfortunately. No. No. I mean, talk about very recognizable moments or, you know, that, that come up, uh, uh, actually townspeople with uh, lanterns looking, hunting down somebody. It's like a... Right. Yeah, that's a callback to, you know, we're all very familiar with that. It seems sort of cozy and almost... Uh, yeah. Uh, old school trite and so on. But uh, my point is like, yeah, well, we're still doing that in some way. Tell, say, so tell us who's in, in uh, Blackout. Well, most importantly uh, is the wonderful Alex Hurt. Now he's the son of William Hurt. Those of us who uh, love older films, not that much older. 
Uh, he's in, you know, broadcast news and uh, big chill, big chill, and so on. So William Hurt was a great actor. You know, Kiss and Spider Woman, all sorts of things, all the way up to. Uh, well, this is not my forte, is remembering things. So, anyway, William Hurt was a great actor, and Alex is his son. And um, I made a film. I produced a film for my own son named uh, Black, uh, called Foxhole, and uh, Alex was in it. Jack, my cool. son, had chosen him through many auditions. And when Alex and I were hanging out on Jack's set, I chatted with him, and he said he became an actor because he loved. <laughs> The old uh, Universal movie, so I thought that was charming. There you go. Uh, and you know, I, I I became aware that he had issues with his dad, and these were all things that were relevant to uh, the character that I was contemplating. So I invited him to be part of it, and you know, he really took the role seriously and saw the the depth that was available there. You know, once again, not condescending. Uh, to the genre, but in fact, seeing something very genuine. And I feel like he gave a really great performance. But then I also, the nature of the werewolf film is it's very episodic because, you know, you're going to have some victims. You know, it's not like, uh, because the werewolf is sort of this transient creature that goes out at night and encounters things, it, it suggests a certain storyline that maybe it's, I found it harder to deal with than, for example, a Frankenstein story. Frankenstein, you're always with the monster, and he's learning about the world, and you're going to have your adventures with that one character. But with the werewolf, you're sort of encountering. So I envision having a, a big cast of people that would show up just for a day or two. And uh, so I was able to call on a lot of old comrades. I saw that. Kevin Corrigan, James LeGro, uh, Barbara Crampton. John, uh, Joe Swanberg, uh, Michael Buscemi, Michael Buscemi, uh, wonderful people, and then certainly some newcomers. And we found Marshall Bell to be the old uh, grumpy white guy who's <laughs> ruining everything. And he's <laughs> well, good at it. He's really good at it. It seemed to come naturally. Uh, <laughs> so I love Marshall. He was fantastic, okay. and you know, uh, cinephiles from. Uh, you know, uh, Paul Verhoeven and Cannon will enjoy him from, uh, well, once again, I can't remember the name of these movies. <laughs> Don't worry about it. Look up the film in IMDb and look up all Marshall the Bell. Marshall Bell. Totally. Marshall's work, is, he's yeah. gone back for decades. Uh, and I hope this is your way of wrapping up because my battery says it's dying. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is, actually. For people that just real quick that want to be able to, to reach out or to find you and your work, uh, where, 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 where should they go? GlassEyePix.com. G-L-A-S-S-E-Y-E-P-I-X. -E -E uh, okay. Not to be confused with X, which is the right. new Twitter. Right. The, the uh, new we're using the X long before Elon was even in long pants. Uh, but despite all that, you can find us, I don't know, on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, it's easy to find. But go to our website. I'm very proud of my website. It's Labyrinthian. And there's great information about the new film there, too, I noticed. Well, thanks, Larry. Thanks for doing this. Really appreciate you. That's it for this episode of the Woodstock Film Festival. Let's Talk Film podcast. Don't forget to please subscribe to, uh, to our YouTube channel. Hit the uh, like button. Follow us on Instagram, Twitter, and Twitter, or X as well. At Woodstock Film Festival. See you next time.